So we are looking at various aspects of climate variability and change over India. So far we have only been looking at glaciers, corals, land use and forests and so on. So let's continue this before we come to some data that looks at actual climate variables. But remember that climate change affects all these things and land use change does affect climate change for example. So we have to track all those things. This is a table that shows population trends in threatened Indian species from the International Union of Conservation of Nature. So it's looking at mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibia and so on. And you can see that the number of threatened species is quite high, especially when you consider the total. And there are some that have had no change, remain stable. Some show some improvement. Lots of them show a decreasing trend or a downward trend. Many of them, the trend cannot be determined. And in many cases, the trend is not available because the data is not long enough. This is why the baselines are very important. So when you're teaching climate change, in your region, you probably want to see if you can have students collect data and keep the data uh, time series going so that over several years you begin to have a baseline of what is happening to the biodiversity in your region. We can never have enough data because without data it's very hard to say how things are changing. So that baseline is always very important. This is showing the statewide distribution of endemic wetland plants threatened birds, fishes and turtles. So by state here you can see and many of them have no data and you can see the numbers vary from whether you are in the Western Ghats region or on the Eastern shore and the number of species that are threatened also depends on where you are. Threatened fishes, there are freshwater fishes, river fishes and also coastal fishes. So turtles, for example, in states like Odisha, sea level rise and warming, etc., are affecting the annual migration of breeding turtles. That is something that is considered a very important part of the global biodiversity that India hosts. So it's important to track those things. India still remains a hotspot for gastroenteritic diseases, waterborne diseases, diarrhea and so on, cholera, and also vector-borne diseases like malaria, dengue, and so on. So enteric fever or typhoid since 2007, the time series is shown here again for various states. The number of cases, you can see that it's generally increased. 2014 was lower than 2015 because 2014 was a, a severe drought. So there are some dynamics that have to be understood. Cholera may go up when there is a flood because of contaminated water being consumed, whereas something like typhoid may go down. So lots of data is needed to see what is the natural system, human system interactions that increase or decrease certain diseases. Mosquito population definitely depends on amount of rain, vegetation and so on. And of course how strong the winds are, how warm the temperatures are and so on and so forth. So even in place like Chhattisgarh for example, the numbers up and down, uh, 2014 is here higher than 2013. So the local distribution of rain matters as well and so on. So you can see that Karnataka has had huge number in 2014 compared to 2013. So at least all the documentation is being done now. This is conversion of forests to agriculture and farms to urbanization. We have to track them fairly carefully. These are areas under crop in food grains in India, thousands of hectares uh, going from 1950-51 to 2010-11. In general, there is an increase in the hectares, number of hectares being used for food grain production. But as I said before, lots of regions where cities are growing fast, consuming the agricultural land around them like Hyderabad or Bangalore or Delhi and so on. So you have some ups and downs and also it might depend on how the monsoon is doing. There may be abandoned lands during certain years. Corresponding to that, the average yield of principal 
crops is going up in terms of quintals per hectare. This is showing total cereals, total pulses and oil seeds. So you can see that the cereals are a large production. We have not explicitly mentioned it, but we said El Nino causes droughts over India, which means crop production is going to be affected by El Nino. So 2009 was an El Nino, 2014 was not officially an El Nino, but it was affected by warm temperatures in the eastern Pacific and so on. So you have certain interannual variability that is related to monsoon changes, which are often related to El Nino changes or Indian Ocean temperature changes and so on. So there is similar upward trend in general in total pulses and oil seeds. These kind of numbers have to be considered along with what are called externalities. In other words, how did the irrigation fertilizer application and so on affect water quality or air quality due to let us say crop residue burning or some other loss from agricultural fields. There are many damages caused during each year due to floods, cyclones, landslides, etc. And this is showing that number. This is the loss of human life, loss of cattle, households and cropped areas affected in lakhs of hectares. There is good news. If you see the number of mortalities or lives lost in number from 2001 to 2012-13 season, the mortalities have dropped. They rose till about 2007-8 and the dynamic forecasting from India Meteorology Department, better flood forecasting, better cyclone forecasting, winds and so on have improved. So they have begun to lead to better action beforehand so that the number of deaths are being reduced. Hopefully this is a systematic trend that will continue downward. For example, there has been a study that compared the big uh, flood in Mumbai during 2005 versus the one that happened in 2017 and it, there are many indications that the handling of the flood in 2007 was much better and the number of mortalities was also reduced compared to 2005. So the huge investment in weather and climate forecasting is, is paying off. So how is the climate itself changing? If you look at the annual mean temperature over India from 1901 to 2014, that's a very long time series, there is definitely an upward trend. So it, the average has gone from about 24.2 to 24.7. That's a half a degree warming over about 100 degrees with some spike in the middle that probably corresponded to a El Nino impact and, or some other uh, heat wave that could have come from the Middle East and so on. So this is consistent with what we have seen in the projections, I mean the modern and historic climate change data. India is warming, tropics are warming and there are differences in the way Bay of Bengal can warm versus Arabian Sea can warm and how that influences the rain and uh, temperature pattern on the Indian subcontinent and so on. So that is shown in terms of the rainfall here going over the same period and I will come back to this in more detail in the lecture on monsoon. So this is showing annual rainfall. So you cannot easily see a trend here, but if you make an anomaly, in other words, if you compute the mean annual rainfall, which is around 900 millimeters and subtract it, then you will see a clearer depiction of how the monsoon is changing. And I will show that when we come to the monsoon lecture. But you can see that monsoon typically has huge droughts like 2009 related to El Nino, 2012 uh, was uh, a lower rainfall, 2013 was near normal or above normal, 14 and 15 were consecutive droughts. But as we said before again and again, Indian rainfall when averaged over all of the country might say it is normal, but the distribution can be very uneven. So you can have excess rainfall in let us say northeast India, but you can have huge deficits in North Karnataka, Maratwada, Vidarbha and so on. 
There has been an analysis of climate change over India by the Indian Network for Climate Change Assessment, which looked at various things like black carbon ecosystem. The CAS looked at various sectors. Developing scenarios were considered impact assessments, vulnerability and adaptation, and greenhouse gas inventory. These are kind of the led by the government efforts to I make their participation in the international climate negotiations more robust. So this happened prior to the Paris Agreement and the whole analysis had to be done and documentation had to be provided. Unfortunately, even the original document from the government is not very clear in its quality. So I will just go through some of the key findings from this report. They focused on four regions, the Western Ghats, the Himalayan region, the coastal regions, and northeast India. And they focused on four sectors, water, food, health, and energy, which I will come to. This findings for each region is consistent with the overall Indian warming. So from the same period, 1900 to about 2007, when this report was written, all the regions are warming at about 0.2 degrees centigrade per decade. And you can see, if you remember, we talked about global warming, pause, and so on. So there are different rates of warming. Usually, the warming is done by taking the final temperature minus the initial temperature and divide by the number of years. That will give you per decade and so on. But you can also do it for different periods. and. There is some indication that since the 1970s there has been accelerated warming and we said that there was pro potentially a global warming pause since 1998 to about 2015. We don't know if the warming has recovered or not because 2015 was a big El Nino. Typically the system goes back to accelerated warming when you have big El Nino then you begin to have regular El Ninos. Remember that during this time we said the eastern Pacific was colder so the ocean was soaking up more heat. Nonetheless, India is warming in all the regions being considered. Spatial patterns of linear trends of annual mean, maximum and minimum temperatures. So this is the annual mean temperature, this is the maximum temperature and this is the minimum temperature. As I said, the warming of the Bay of Bengal and Arabian Sea are occurring at a different rate, which has something to do with the way the dynamics works, which we will understand better when we talk about the monsoon. So the circulation itself, as it changes seasonally, then creates these patterns of where maximum warming happens, uh, the so-called core monsoon zone, for example, or the regions that are more affected by winds coming from the west, or winds coming from the east and so on. So this is for 1901 to 2007 and this is for 1971 to 2007, the accelerated warming period. The main message we have seen before is that the minimum temperatures are increasing and maximum temperatures are increasing. The maximum temperatures sometimes are limited as to how warm they can get because of the energy available from the sun and also because Typically, rainfall season arrives, which begins to cool the Indian temperatures. So most countries will consider June, July, August as their summer season, whereas India typically has April, May, uh, April, March, and May to be the warmest months because then in June, July, August, we have rainfall and the entire country actually cools down quite a bit, correct? So that shows up in the patterns as well where it rains more and where it rains less. So this is the rainfall now shown with respect to a long-term mean rain, which is around this basis. So when these bars are above the mean, that means we have excess monsoon, floods, and normal years. And when it is below, shown typically in red and green colors, then it is deficit year. So you can see that these stars, most of the dry years are El Nino years. So El Nino affects the Indian monsoon. Most of the wet years are La Nina years where we said the temperatures in the East Pacific are colder than normal. 
But the key thing we will talk about again in the monsoon lecture is not all dry years are explained by El Nino. So, there is some other process that affects the monsoon and not uh, all wet years are explained by La Nina. And you can already begin to imagine, if you remember our El Nino uh, fundamentals, you can again look up the separate module that is provided for El Nino. El Nino peaks during December, January, February. So, the maximum warm temperatures in the East Pacific, which is an indication of El Nino, actually occurs during December, January, February. And that is exactly why the name El Nino came, because the warm waters during Christmas time were considered a gift from Jesus. So, uh, it is referred to as El Nino or the child or the Christ child, whereas the monsoons actually peak during June, July, August. So, the El Nino is still in its growing phase during June, July, August when the monsoon is occurring. So, when the El Nino is very strong, then its impact can be very strong six months before its peak, but if it is not so strong, then it may not be affecting the monsoon so strong. The key question there is we do not know exactly how the monsoon itself may be affecting the El Nino. There is some indication that maybe the monsoon has its own mind and when it decides to become a deficit year or a, or a wet year independent of El Nino, maybe it affects the El Nino or La Nina that is trying to grow. But these are complicated science questions. Nonetheless, you can see that typically back to back wet years are quite common, but back to back dry years are not so common. It happened in 2014, 15 and maybe 86, 87 and back in 1922, 23 or some time early on in the century. So, there are very few back to back droughts over India, but again this means average over all of India. You always have droughts in places like Maratwada. So, if you tell the farmers back to back droughts do not happen, they might get very angry with you. So, how do we look for trends? When we look for the temperature, we see that usually it is very clear that there is a trend. Remembering again that the precipitation is like popcorn and does not directly correspond to precipitation. You see that when we look at the uh, standard deviation or variation of precipitation on decadal time scales or 10 year time scales, the mean varies. So, there are decades when the monsoon is less than normal and there are decades where monsoon is more than normal. So, these periods typically last something like 10 to 20, 25 years. Some ideas exist as to why the monsoon swings above normal and then back below normal, but to keep in mind in the last few decades we have been in the low cycle. This is complicated because are we going to go back or is global warming keeping us down here for longer than? So, was global warming affecting things here or is it affecting more here? If so, what is it doing? This is a very complicated issue as well. So, that is what we have to always worry about. So, some of the projections for India were done by what is called RCM, which is based on a GCM, we have not defined these terms yet. So, this is called general circulation model and this is a regional or general, uh, yes, usually general circulation model. Some people call it global climate model. That is not very accurate because we have an ocean GCM and we have an atmosphere GCM. So, those are really circulation model. RCM on the other hand is a regional climate model. Typically, we take the simulations made by a global circulation model and we set up a model that is for a particular region and we use the circulation from this at these boundaries and then see what happens in the inside. I am not going to go into details, but only advantage of doing that is because of computational power, you cannot have a very uh, small grids when you do global circulation. Typically, now they are of the order of 100 kilometers by 100 kilometers, but some are being run at 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers, 
remember it has to have grids in the vertical in the atmosphere, grids in the vertical in the ocean, grids over land, grids over ice, vegetation and so on and so forth. But when you make a regional model like this, computational power needed is much lower. So, these can be run at much higher resolution often at 1 kilometer by 1 kilometer, which means the mountains can be represented much better. Remember, if you have a grid, we looked at one of the figures early on where the continent will look like a brick, like a Lego piece because the grid sizes are too coarse. So, with those basic words, I will show one attempt made by India, which was done at the Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology in Pune. Some several simulations were made to downscale projections from IPCC. It was done with the previous analysis, which was AR4. Remember, a lot of the things we looked are from AR5, which was released in 2014. This was released in 2007. So, I won't go into the details because it's not clear how accurate these are. There are lots of details because it was not, ocean was not actively involved, land was only partially actively involved and so on and so forth. So, for the 2030s, this is showing monsoon simulations as seen by the real world and that is compared to the model simulation to say that the model does a reasonable job. And then projections are made for 2030s with respect to the 1970s. What is it doing? Basically, it is amplifying the orographic rain or the western Ghats rain. I used a term here called orographic, which means orography means topography or mountains and so on and valleys. So, if the air is coming this way from the Arabian Sea, it is bringing a lot of moisture it hits the western Ghats, it has to rise to go over. When it rises, air expands and cools, so rain falls. This is why you have lots of rain Karnataka to Maharashtra, right, on the coastal side. And this is why when you go on this side, moisture has been squeezed, so you have less rain on this side. So, this projection says that these are just different projections with various choices of emission scenarios. And it is showing that maybe in the central eastern part, some projections show increased rainfall. Even this one is showing some increase, but here it is showing a reduction. In the northeast, they are mostly showing an increase and so on. So, these are not evaluated very robustly, so I would not worry too much about them. But their surface temperature climatologies and projections with the various same various simulations and the annual surface temperatures in the 19, 2030s compared to 1970s, everything seems to be warming. So, there are some patterns higher warming here than here and here and also on the northeastern side. So, ocean is warming as expected. Temperature projections in general are much more reliable. I have said this again and again and that is still true. So, given the radiation forcing and the greenhouse gas changes, the models are able to do the temperature very well and then temperature to humidity relation is very clear as we said with 1 degree centigrade warming you get 7 percent increase in humidity. But then the rainfall change tends to be 2 to 3 percent, but the extreme rainfall can be 10 percent to 30 percent. So, models have easy time doing this part, but to convert it to rain, it is always difficult because rain is popcorns, right. So, you have to always remember that. So, this is the minimum and maximum temperature projections from various scenarios and you can see again that the minimum temperatures are expected to increase more than the maximum temperatures because maximum temperatures are already kind of at their limit in many ways. And as the maximum temperatures begin to get realized, you often have rainfall and cooling. The minimum temperatures are also important because if you are thinking about monsoon season, pests and so on that damage crops, increased minimum temperature means the pests do not die. So, you will have more pests surviving throughout the year. 
so crop damages will be more. So there are many impacts that we are not very intuitive, we have to always pay attention to those. Frequency of cyclonic disturbances forming over the Bay of Bengal region. So I will, when we do the monsoon lecture I will show, but if you imagine the India is here, Bay of Bengal has very warm waters, we will see that also. There are so called cyclonic disturbances or low pressure systems. They are not cyclones, they are cyclonic disturbances. They have a low pressure, they have a wind velocity of eight and a half meters per second and they last for several days. And they move into India and they bring moisture. So we have moisture coming this way and also some moisture coming back this way. So it turns out that because of the various global warming and climate change, the cyclonic disturbances that bring moisture here have been decreasing over time, which has an impact because the mean rainfall has decreased over this period. We will see that in more detail. Why is this happening? It is not completely clear, but there are many technical details which show that they are increasing at the weather scale, which means two to about 10 days. They are decreasing at what are called intra-seasonal time scale, so more like 10 to 60 days. So they are intra-seasonal. If you think of one season as 90 days, intra-seasonal is less than 90 days. So 10 to 60 days is less than 90 days. So there are all these kind of details that are not completely understood, but there are lots of papers coming out every year showing more and more understanding of why the system behaves this way. I will not go into further details because I will come back to many more monsoon details when we do the monsoon lectures. Okay? India has had lots of tide gauges along the coast, some of which have data going back to more than 100 years. You can see that Mumbai has had tide gauge for more than 113 years now. This is from 2007, so already many more years. Um, and all of them have trends in sea level rise. So you have to account for isostatic adjustment. Remember we said eustatic and isostatic. Isostatic is when the land is rising and sinking locally. Eustatic is when glacier melts and the water released is spread throughout the world ocean, so the entire world ocean adjusts. So locally, isostatic changes can contribute significant to sea level rise because if the land is sinking, then sea level rise will be relatively much higher. So at Mumbai, from 0.77 millimeter per year, the net sea level rise increases to 1.2 millimeter per year because of the isostatic adjustment. Different rates, Kochi is going much faster. The fastest one is happening in this area and it turns out that it is because of the enormous amount of sediments coming with Ganga Brahmaputra river which are actually pushing the ocean floor down. So much weight is being put on the ocean floor that it is being pushed down. So it has warming, Bay of Bengal is very warm already and this sinking together is causing massive amount of sea level rise. How is does this compare to global sea level rise? Global sea level rise is in the order of 2 to 3 millimeters per year. So this is almost twice the global rate. That is not good news because much of this Ganga, Brahmaputra, Delta and Bangladesh and all are basically at sea level. So if cyclones begin to increase, the storm surge and the inundation is going to increase because it is going to sweep in more and more water onto land because of the sea level rise. Something to remember. So sea level rise is a huge concern for India. This is showing the storm frequency anomaly. As I said, the warming of the sea surface temperatures is, is fairly clear. This is looking at the pre-monsoon season, the monsoon season and the post-monsoon season. So this is something I should have emphasized, uh, I will emphasize again when we do the monsoons, but Indian Ocean and Indian climate and weather is obviously seriously affected by the seasonal changes. We have the southwest monsoon and the northeast monsoon, so everything is seasonal. So when we look at trends, it is always best to look at what is happening in the pre-monsoon and what is happening in the post-monsoon and what is happening in the monsoon period. 
So, all the periods are warming. The cyclones also are different in the pre monsoon, monsoon, and post monsoon season. Why? Remember when we talked about hurricanes and cyclones, we said when there is a strong vertical shear or the change in direction of the winds or change in strength of the winds with height from the surface, then the cyclone which is trying to grow will lose its energy because the winds will chop off the top of the cyclone or the hurricane that suppresses the cyclone growth. So, during the monsoon, the vertical change of winds is very strong. So, in fact, the cyclone season is very weak during the Indian monsoon. So, the cyclones are more during the pre monsoon and especially during the post monsoon. Okay? So, we have to look at the trends during all of them. So, the net result is that the storm frequency anomaly seems to be decreasing during all three seasons and I will come back to that. It turns out that this story is quite a bit more complicated than that in the sense again as we said in the case of hurricanes, total number of cyclones may decrease, but the strongest of the cyclones may be more. So, warm temperatures, more humidity means more fuel, warm ocean also means when the cyclone happens, the cooling does not happen. Remember hurricanes mix the water and water is colder below. If you remember it, temperature with depth, we said warm near the surface, cold below the surface. So, the cold water is mixed up. So, the hurricane tends to move to warmer waters, but if the ocean warms, then you are going to have more warm water. Even if the hurricane mixes, you will have more warm water. So, they can grow faster, get stronger. So, stronger cyclones can be more even if the total number of cyclones can be less. This is something we have to remember. So, I will add a little bit more of complication there. Since India is our region, you probably do want to emphasize specificities of Indian region more in your course. Global context is good, but all that can be meaningless unless we know what it means for us. right? So, in that sense, Bay of Bengal and Arabian Sea are fundamentally different. It has lot of rivers here, which means fresh water is put on top and that makes the ocean quite warm. Whereas, remember we said winds are sweeping in like this in the summer. So, these are what we call along shore winds. So, the Coriolis would force the water to move this way as it is being dragged by the winds this way, because in the northern hemisphere to the right, if you pull the water away from the coast, colder water comes up. So, you have colder waters here and during the northeast monsoon also, you have stronger winds here than here. So, that cold dry air coming from the continents has more evaporation, because drier wind can take up more humidity. So, also there is evaporative cooling during the winter. The net result is that Arabian Sea is in general colder, significantly colder than the Bay of Bengal, which means if you try to warm the Bay of Bengal, it will just begin to have more convection or warm rising air, more rain, whereas this can continue to warm for a few more degrees. So, anytime you have sea surface temperature more than 28 and a half degree centigrade or so, atmosphere begins to convect. So, if you are less than that, then the ocean can keep getting warmer without convecting. So, this is warming fast, this one is convecting more because if you try to warm it, it convects more. That is maybe the reason why also we have reduced monsoon low pressure systems, cyclonic depressions and so on and so forth. So, that sounds complicated, but if you sit down with it and follow the modules that are also given, you will have a basic idea of how to include this in the course, because this becomes very important for climate change over India. So, this is the trends of frequency of cyclonic storms over the northern Indian Ocean, Bay of Bengal and Arabian Sea. So, you can see that generally northern Indian Ocean is showing decreasing cyclonic storms as we said in the previous uh, storm frequency uh, analysis. Bay of Bengal is decreasing because you cannot warm it much more, 
whereas the Arabian Sea is in fact beginning to increase. This stops in 1996 or so. In the recent years, it is clear that the Arabian Sea is in fact having increased cyclones. So, even if you do not remember anything or you do not want to give too many details to the students depending on at what level they are, you want to show the SST map and explain the differences and say the warmer temperatures here cannot be warmed too much more, hence cyclones may decrease, whereas this one can continue to warm and cyclones can increase. This is very important. Okay? There are other differences. These cyclones tend to go this way, hit India, Bangladesh, Myanmar and so on, whereas these typically go off and hit Oman and on the other side because the winds are steering those cyclones that way. But once in a while, they can curve back and hit Gujarat, Bombay and so on. Very rare, but it does happen. Those are the kind of details we have to remember. The associated storm surges are still a major concern. So, if you look at what is called a 100 year return level of estimated storm surge. What is 100 year return level? That means some storms are so strong that you can calculate and show that they only ha happen once in 100 years. Okay? The return level means essentially global warming begins to make one in a 100 year storms more often. They will make them maybe once in 50 years, maybe once in 30 years and so on. So, that is called loading the dice. That means when you throw a dice, it is supposed to give you random distribution of numbers each time. But if you load it, you can make sure that this is guaranteed to roll 7 or 11 every time. So, you can load it with a weight so that when you throw it, it is not rolling uh, evenly, but it is preferring one state all the time. So, the climate change or global warming essentially begins to load the dice in every region. So, in our region, the 100 year return level is going to become more frequent than that. So, if you look at several stations and look at the storm surge, which is basically how much water is being swept in by the cyclones, you can see that 100 year return level for the period 1961 to 1990 was in this range, two and a half to eight meters. But we are expecting that as we go into the future, some regions will increase and Sagar on the Karnataka side is expected to remain almost the same or decrease. There is some uncertainty there. So, that means that the sea level is not uniform. If you look at sea level rise on this side and this side, it is not uniform because it depends on the dynamics, how currents change, how eustatic changes and isostatic changes combine to give you the sea level rise. Okay? Something to always remember. So, it is a complicated situation basically. You have to estimate as best as you can what the storm surge is because that will determine your mitigation and adaptation strategies. This is showing a IRS satellite image for Kochi region and this is showing if the sea level rises by 1 meter, what would happen? How many regions would be underwater with 1 meter sea level rise. But this is not just the only story because if you have cyclones coming in, as I said cyclones usually go that way, but once in a while if you have a cyclone turn around, then much more water is going to be swept in because now you have more sea level rise, more water being swept in by the cyclones. Another example is for Paradeep region. And you can see that this one is going to have huge amounts of loss to 1 meter sea level rise because it is much closer to sea level than Kochi. So, this is done for almost all coastal regions of India, the projections. Okay? So, that is very important. And usually, like Kochi has a navy, for example, naval base. So, the navies typically do not wait for how certain it is that sea level will rise by 1 meter. 
what they will do is we must protect our harbors or ports be able to protect the country etc so they will just cost they will say if i want to plan for 1 meter sea level rise how much it will cost if i want to protect against 2 meter sea level rise how much it will cost so they will plan based purely on cost so their mitigation adaptation strategy will be based on cost rather than they don't have to worry about uncertainty whether it will be 1 meter half a meter or 1.5 meter they will just say let's plan according to what budget we can afford so private communities on the other hand cannot do the same necessarily but some communities are hiring engineers to do such calculations and say we want to protect our area against half a meter sea level rise tell us how much it will cost and then they will adjust their planning according to the cost okay so let's look at some other sectors that are being affected this is the past trends in weather and productivity of coconuts in western ghats area i won't go into the detail other than to show that the maximum minimum temperatures uh, changes and changes in mean temperature days where very warm temperatures happen and days where very cold temperatures happen relative humidity which matters a lot for plant growth rainfall of course which is very important very heavy rainfall is bad less rain is bad how the rain is distributed over the season is bad so net overall change things like dry spell and uh, so on are looked at at various places from ratnagiri down to uh, trivandrum and you can see that there are various trends observed over these coastal regions relative humidity changes maximum minimum temperature changes almost all of them are experiencing more warm days and fewer cold days which is consistent with what we have seen rainfall intensity changes a little bit here and there days with small rainfall are generally decreasing dry spells also all over the place so coconut productivity may be benefiting in some places right now but the question is as the warming continues and the warm days continue and the humidity increases and rainfall increases where is the optimum temperature so if you plot light levels and humidity levels and photosynthetic rates typically the curves look like this so photosynthesis can benefit up to certain warming because the growth rates increase but once you cross certain threshold then photosynthesis begins to drop the plants begin to die so this is something to be kept in mind for all crops including areca nut coconut fruits vegetables and so on there is some data on fisheries over india india has lots of artisanal fisheries or subsistence fisheries people who fish just for surviving they don't have big ships in which they catch a lot of fish and export and so on so trawling is basically uh, something that where huge net is cast and they drag the bottom and pick up everything that is in its way so they it is done for catching mackerel for example and the number of boats have increased so that is generally led to increasing mackerel uh, catch so the number of trawlers themselves uh, have gone up uh, does that mean that the number of fish are going up not necessarily there is a complicated story there so you cannot see this again as i said the figures in the document are not very clear so there is some cash crop called the thread fin bream japanese thread fin bream so that is called nemipterus japonicus and this is called nemipterus mesoprion two types of fish and they have a seasonal impact again so the spawners are generally increasing in the october to march season whereas they are decreasing in the april to september season so seasonality is everything over the indian ocean and the indian region and indian coasts so over 1980 to 2003 there is this kind of dichotomy for both fishes so this has to be understood in terms of how the life cycle of the spawners is changing based on the season it's likely that the october march time when the winds are from the north is cooling the temperature whereas the april september period when the winds are more from the southwest is causing more warming so even the warming has to be seen 
with seasons and so on. This depends on how close you are to the coast, uh, open ocean and so on and so forth. The other things looked at, apple productivity trends in Himachal Pradesh. So as minimum temperatures begin to go up and maximum temperatures begin to go up, the yield begins to drop. So you can see that certain ecosystems like the Himalayan ecosystems or the Western Ghats are more sensitive. So over 1981 to 2000 in 20 years, the apple production has dropped and there are ups and downs which are still related to El Nino and so on, but nonetheless overall there is a, a lower trend. So for doing vegetation, crops, diseases and so on, a combined stress index is created. This works also for humans because how heat stressed you feel, how the heat wave works depends not just on temperature but also how humid it is. Humidity increases the heat index. So here it is looking at comfortable range, mid-level stresses and severe stresses and you can see that coastal India is already in severe stress when you combine humidity and temperature. Large part of the central India is already in a mid-level stress but high altitudes under the Himalayan range are still in the comfortable range but they are also beginning to inch up and get more and more stressed. These are the projected changes in thermal stress for 2030 over parts of India. It's calculated from the regional circulation model for some of the older scenarios from AR4. Okay? So you can see that you cannot see the numbers very well but the increase in the heat stress in January of the present level and 2030 are much higher. So some of these are already very hot spots. If you go to Vizag, Vijayawada and other places in uh, Andhra and uh, so on or coastal regions here which are already quite humid and so on, they are going to get much worse. So that translates into health problems, crop yield problems, energy demand problems, water demand problems and so on and so forth. This is showing for the Himalayan and Northeast region changes, again huge changes, negative changes by 2030. You can see that from the present level to the future levels, significant increases. Unfortunately, you cannot see here, but nonetheless, you can see that mild to moderate heat stresses are going to go up quite a bit. Let's look at some more ecological, structural, functional and phylogenetic aspects of microbes in the Indian Himalayan regions. So I won't go into the details but I just want you to be aware of just how much analysis has already been done so that future projections have to continuously monitor how these systems are responding. So these are the various papers which have reported these results but they include various negative impacts, decrease in microbial population. Microbial populations everywhere, especially in the soils, they play a very critical role, including humans. It is now known that gut microbes in humans are very important for overall health, including depression, sleep patterns, digestion and so on. And with warming, we, we get uh, disturbed as well and soil microbes are going to get disturbed as well which increases the soil respiration, carbon release and so on. And some of the slopes of the, the, of the mountains and so on, it turns out are more sensitive than flat grounds. In flat grounds, as we said before in another example, the climate velocity can be very fast. So the species cannot move very fast. Whereas on the mountains, the, the climate velocity can be lower, so species can potentially move to higher altitudes more easily, whereas on a flat ground, you have no place to run or no place to hide. Inability of tropical plant growth in promoting bioinoculants against a susceptibility to cyclotolerant plant growth, other biotic factors like temperatures and mountain aspects, various parasites and beneficial bacteria and microbes. So we won't go into the details, but you can see that various species are concerned various considered, various regions are considered, tolerance of humidity and temperature are considered, 
occurrences of new species are considered, emergence of new viral problems are considered and so on. So, biological responses are going to be the most complicated because the biodiversity changes from spot to spot and as I have stressed before, ecosystems do not move. When you have a ecosystem, a certain collection of species that is functioning together very well in one location, if it has to shift, only few species will be able to move which we called mobile generalists. The so called sedentary specialists will likely end up dying. So, this response is going to be very complicated, but you will have a special lecture on vegetation response to climate change and so on by uh, another faculty. This is region wise projections of percent grids where vegetation type changes is expected in A 1 B climate by 2035. So, I would wait for these because this was done from a global model. So, it is not very region specific. I will show in the end of this lecture that right now India has invested huge resources in making more accurate projections with a better model. I will mention briefly the model. Nonetheless, the four regions Himalayas, coastal regions, western Ghats and northeast, there are number of grids where the changes are expected to varying degrees of percentages. We already know that the Himalayas are most vulnerable, coastal regions are moderately vulnerable, western Ghats this may be changed after the recent spate of floods in the western Ghats because of changes, land use change and so on. Maybe we have lost enough biodiversity that maybe western Ghats will be now classified as also most vulnerable if not more than moderately vulnerable. Northeast right now seems least vulnerable. So, we have to see how that is evolving since 2007. So, this analysis is from 2007. So, you would want to wait for seeing how the analysis that will come out in 2021 will reclassify these in terms of vulnerability. Okay? So, other impacts obviously health in various regions of India very critical Himalayan regions, western Ghats, coastal zone and northeast India. Temperatures increasing and intensity of hot days increasing forest fires, increased glacier melt. There are already many emerging impacts of impacts on health related to flash floods like malaria and morbidity due to rise in temperature which means people just do not feel like working when it is very, very hot. So, if you go to places like Bihar, what are the chances that farmers are going to able to work in the middle of the day. So, similar effects are seen in every place. Again, the mountain slopes are more vulnerable to flash floods which means certain amount of rain will produce huge deluges. This is very critical to keep in mind. So, the vulnerability maps are being produced, hazard maps are being produced so that mitigation and adaptation policies can specifically address resources to the regions where vulnerability is high and then you have to figure out why it is high, whether it is economic problem, whether it is education problem, whether it is information problem or access to information problem and so on and so forth. So, if you look at typical parasite species that exist in India which relate to plasmodium which is obviously the malaria causing parasite, you can see that Total malaria cases seem to have dropped over 2001 to 2014. Number of deaths have dropped which is good case, which is a good news and this is for India still a continuing issue in the sense how do you control mosquito population? Does everybody have nets? Uh, so, the overall drop may be hiding certain averages. So, if you think about rural population versus urban population, urban population now has more access to closed windows, nets, air conditioning, cleaner surroundings maybe and so on. So, the details of where it is that 
actual downward trend is happening and how the averaging is affecting the overall trend has to be looked at. And you can look at that by looking at transmission windows in the various regions. So, the number of malaria transmission months, if you look at the various places and in terms of the number of districts, you have to compare the baselines versus projections. So, this gives you much more region specific details to see which regions are getting wetter. So, maybe more mosquito populations, which regions may be getting drier, does that mean less mosquitoes or does that mean use of water is in such a way that you are storing more water and increasing mosquitoes. All kinds of details have to be looked at plus you also have to look at things like temperature effect and humidity effect. So, malaria is also looked at in terms of temperature change and humidity change because temperature causes certain breeding cycle in mosquitoes and humidity causes certain effect on the breeding cycle of mosquitoes. So, the transmission window depends not just on temperature or humidity, but a combined index that depends on temperature and humidity. So, again this was done by using global models. So, I would wait for the new projections and see how these will change, but more specifically how the regional projections will change over time. Let us stop today with the looking at water resources. I showed one in the very beginning which is the same table. So, the estimated annual precipitation in terms of kilometer cubed, look at the utilization of water for 2000. So, domestic irrigation, look at the number industry and energy use. So, the irrigation is 10 times more than domestic use or industry and energy use. This is something to be kept in mind. Food production, agriculture is very critical, huge contributor to GDP. More importantly, it contributes to something like 60 percent of the total employment over India, but it is also a huge water sink. So, what are the options there for mitigating and adapting? How can irrigation efficiency be used? How can tube well water use can be reduced and so on. So, we will look at those things when we get slowly into what India is planning for reducing energy use, sustainable use of ground water, surface water and so on. So, see you next time.